things about Grandma Mary from my perspective. Mary was an amazing person. <laughs> They say that people seldom remember what you say, but they will always remember the way that you make it feel. Yeah. I always felt loved by Grandma Mary. I never felt judged through my wife. Mary was somebody that I felt safe with, and I knew that any time I was in her home or her presence. She exuded love. And I think that that is her true legacy that she's left for her children and her grandchildren, me, and her three grandchildren, my, my sons and my daughter, and now their children. Because her greatest gift and legacy to all of us in this room was her service to God, and she showed us how to love God through loving others. And my, my last is one memory, my last thing that I want to share that goes to that. When I was around 19, her and Grandpa Elliot came to visit us, and it was before I was married, and they wanted to share with me what they thought love was and that what biblical love was and what it is in marriage. And I, I don't think I ever really understood what love was until they shared this with me. When they shared Corinthians, that love is an action, love is a choice, it is not just a feeling or an emotion. And when they shared that with me, I knew at that point that that's what I wanted to give. So, most people quote this verse at weddings, but I think that it's perfect for my grandmother at her death because this is what she gave her entire life to. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, and it is not proud. And that was my grandma. So ditto to what Shannon said. I <laughs> never ever felt like I was ever a granddaughter-in-law around Ellen Marriott and Nellie. And they, they were just wonderful people. Uh, one of the uh, memories that I have of grandma is Andrew and I decided that we were we would only been married for a couple of years, and we just were getting ready to buy a house, and we really wanted to go and spend a vacation, a spring break, with Grandma and Grandpa, so they took us up to Gold Beach. So I've never been to the Oregon Coast, and it's springtime, and all of you know, it's cold up there, and the water is very, very cold. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go play in the lakes, and then I get down there, and I kind of put my toe in, and I'm like, oh, it's too cold for me. Where's Grandma? Oh, she's got her pant legs rolled all the way up to her knees, socks and shoes in her hands, just walking in the waves like it was nothing. And I wasn't going to be shown up by, by Grandma. <laughs> so I got in the water and we looked for shells and rocks, and so that was just a, a really fun fun memory of, of playing with grandma.
So, um, most, most of uh, Grandma's life, obviously, if you saw the slides, occurred before I was born. <laughs> um, and, and yet, there was, uh, um, my life was still um, made better by her example. Um, as a child, I got to spend uh, an occasional week with Grandma and Grandpa uh, during the summer, which was wonderful. Uh, riding her bike around town, and, uh, the best strawberry milkshakes, <laughs> and uh, multiple days with them at the Oregon coast, uh, which of course Grandma absolutely loved, uh, and I did too, but it was a, a special thing for Grandma. In those brief, brief weeks that I had to spend with her, uh, I, I witnessed uh, her faithfully meeting uh, for prayer and encouragement with other women in the church, um, and I was personally uh, neglectful or dishonest, uh, she corrected me with gentleness, um, and she taught lessons in Sunday school that I've retained to this day. <laughs> so, uh, just her faithfulness in, in, in the ministry of a, of a mother and a grandmother you know, has, has been kept even to now. And of course, I'm especially thankful for her faithfulness in raising her son, which very definitely affected my life. <laughs> Um, I, I praise God for her life, lived, lived faithfully, and uh, I praise God that she is uh, now forever in the presence of our Savior and King. Yeah. Well, I did steal a little bit of my memories. Uh, as those years in, uh, in the opportunities we had to visit during the summer were very formative, and uh, at the same time, as I gave some thought to what I remember most about my grandmother, it was mostly pictures. Um, and when I say pictures, I don't mean just snapshots, but more vignettes. And when I say that, one of the things that always comes to my mind is, my father was a bit of a, a jokester, not tons, but a little bit. Harry very much so. <laughs> and, and even grand, Grandpa loves so. Uh, Grandpa Lovelace, uh, Elliot, also was at times. And there was this, this way she would respond, a, a tone of the voice, just this, first the eyebrows would go up. <laughs> oh, you think so? <laughs> the other one was, oh, oh, oh. It was, it was just this, this, this like, oh, oh, oh. And, and to this day, that just sticks with me uh, very much so. Um, going back in pictures to the times when we were, um, especially the one time where Andrew was unlucky enough to have to spend the week with me, uh, also there, my first time there. Uh, the things we, she put us to work quite wisely because two rambunctious boys, while they can entertain one another, it's the best to put them to work. It's usually destructive. Yeah, it's usually destructive, although we played many a day of staying alive and uh, Simon, those, those spent many hours. But, one thing that sticks out in my mind is Grandma, another one of those vignettes is in the morning, in her kind of dressing gown, uh, or, or nightgown, sitting in her chair, doing more, her devotions. Because her faith, as Andrew pointed out, was very real. And it was also between her and her Lord and her God, not just in front of other people. Um, and that was, that's something that stands out. Along with that, uh, I remember, um, Many uh, a Sunday evening, uh, walking to the chapel from their home there at Tat. And just the, the sunlight kind of hitting the trees, walking around that little corner at the end of the road, uh, the reflectors sticking out of the road. That was so strange to me as a kid. Those little reflectors that stuck out of the road. Um, but just that she would, she would wrangle you know, a couple of young boys and get us to chapel on time that, you know, on Sunday evenings. Uh, I still remember that. Um, and I, I kind of have to laugh, the last one that um, really sticks out to my mind, besides going to Food for Less for uh, bubblegum ice cream, that one sticks out, but besides that, uh, the one is uh, her recounting to me on one or two occasions uh, how God changed her life. Uh, and she recounts to me how she was, she was a wild teenager who in the early days of automobiles uh, would 
get together with her friends and they'd go racing down the roads of uh, <laughs> Cajun County and probably Minidoka County as well. And they'd just be tearing around and, and she she emphasized, I mean I could picture it because of the way she described it, but she emphasized just how drastic the work that God didn't take her and stifle her as a person and suddenly make her mild and me. She still had that spitfire even much many years later. And she still loved adventure, uh, but God did take a wild heart and turn it into someone who was loving and caring and uh, just a powerful witness for Christ. So that is what I remember, and uh, I'm sure there's many more memories to be shared. Elliot, when she's with again now. 
they can put themselves in the way because they gave their lives to this as well. But it means suffering, and it means hardship, and Paul lives with that. See, Paul had this hope that we're going to talk about, but he didn't just have this hope so that he could feel more comfortable in this life. He had this hope so that he could feel more confident laying down his life. And more than that, he had something to give his life to. Listen to what he says going on in chapter 4. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Paul knew that as he served people by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them, he wasn't just serving in a life that would be followed by an eternal life. He was serving and planting seeds, and he was going to take the fruit with him. And this is what the hope of eternal life did for Paul. This is why it was so important. But it all depends on him having a real and true hope of eternal life. And Paul had a hope that could not be shaken. Why don't we dig into this hope in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And generally when I preach, nobody cares what I think. So I just look at the Bible and I say, let me ask you a few questions and see what I can learn. And one of the first things that I notice is that we as people are meant to live in bodies. We know that if our earthly tent is destroyed, we don't just float around existing outside of our tent. We have a new, more permanent building from God. Paul referred to this state of being without a body, as being unclothed or naked. He said, we don't want to be unclothed. We want to put on a new outfit, so to speak. And in this life, we find fulfillment in the relationships and in the experiences and in going out when the weather's beautiful on the Oregon coast, perhaps. And some of these memories have been shared today. That's because we're built to enjoy those things. We're made to enjoy those things. Those aren't opposed to heaven. In fact, in the new life, we're just going to have more of that. And that leads me to the second thing that I've noticed in this text, that we are meant to live in bodies, but we aren't meant to live in bodies like these. Paul said that we who live in this tent, we groan. Well, if we're in a tent, why do we groan? Anybody who's spent a few days in a tent will tell you why you're growing. <laughs> a tent is meant to be lived in for maybe a few days, but there's a lot of things that it lacks. A house is meant to be lived in permanently. And Paul says that we have a tent, but we are going to have a house. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. See, it's not supposed to be like this. We're not supposed to have bodies that are so corrupted and decaying every day, even young bucks like me, we don't <laughs> notice our body decaying, but we will. You guys in the older generation try to warn us. <laughs> but corrupted by the taint and temptation of sin every day, and corrupted by that constant inevitability that it can't last, that the death is coming, it's not supposed to be like that. And I'm so glad that we can have a very comforting time of remembering a long and fulfilling life well lived. And we, we love to come to funerals like this rather than the funeral of someone who, as we put it, died before they died. But it's never supposed to be like this, even at a funeral like this. It's supposed to be better. That's good news because it's going to be better. And that longing, that longing is important. I hope that the words that I speak by God's grace through his word, and give you guys some measure of comfort. But I also hope it will give you guys a certain kind of discomfort as well. <laughs> discomfort with what you see around you, discomfort with this life, because this isn't about where we're supposed to stay. 
We're meant to live in bodies, but we're not meant to live in these bodies. We're meant to live in eternal bodies for an eternal moment. What else do we notice here? We're going to get those bodies. It's a guarantee. It's an absolute 100% take it to the bank guarantee. Look at verse 5 again. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Why do we know for sure that Mary is going to walk and speak and run and jump and praise God all over again for eternity? Why can we be so sure? Because the person who prepared her for that and who has prepared the promise for her is not just a man, but it's God. I make promises all the time, and I really try to fulfill them, but I'm also a really forgetful person. So you trust in my integrity, I hope, but maybe not my uh, reliability all the time. I am not making you guys this promise. God is making this promise. And another reason we know that this promise is going to come true is because he's given us his spirit as a guarantee. And those of you guys who have lived the life of faith and have felt the Spirit giving you power over sin, giving you hope, and giving you that connection to God, you know what it's like. That's not just a help for you in this life, it's a promise of what's to come. And because of how powerful that promise is, you know it's going to come true. The other reason that we know this is going to come true comes in the next few verses, starting in verse 6. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I can tell you that God has made you a promise. And I can tell you that your earthly tent, your temporary dwelling, is going to be replaced by something so much better. But that won't make a difference to you unless you're willing to believe in something that you can't see. I can't see God and I can't see Mary anymore. But I know because I walk by faith, not by sight. And if we're willing to walk by faith and not by sight, we can claim hold of a hope that we cannot lose. But the hope is not just in a new body. And it's not just in a new redeemed earth that we're going to live in because it's going to be a new earth that we're going to praise the Lord in. It's the hope of a person. And that's the other thing that I noticed here, because after talking about the glories of the new body, he has something else to say here at the end. He says, we are confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And this gives us even more hope, because, well, we know that Mary hasn't gotten her brand spanking new body yet. She, she hasn't gotten it. When Jesus comes back, she's going to get it, and if he comes back while we're still alive, he's going to beat us. She's going to beat us to his side. <laughs> She's going to lead us in the dust. And I hope that happens. But where is she right now? For Paul, there are only two places you could be. You could be here on earth in your body, or you could be with Jesus. And then afterwards, you're with Jesus in your new body. There's no intermediate state, there's no soul sleep, and there's no getting lost in transit. Mary is by the side of Jesus Christ at this very moment. And that tells us something about the hope, because the hope isn't ultimately just in a new body free from the aches and pains. It's from a new body that is fit to be with a person, because the hope is to be with a person. The Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Philippians that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he said, I'm not sure which one I want, which is an odd thing to hear someone say when you're talking about life versus death. But he said, if I stay on this earth, there's so much more I can do for the Lord. But then he said, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. For Mary, the best has only begun. Because for her, just being with Jesus is so much better than all of the treasures of this world put together. That's what Paul's hope is. And that's why Paul could rush headlong into death if Christ asked him to. And he eventually did. Because he knew that all he was losing was this world. <laughs> Something my dad once referred to as chump junk compared to Jesus. And I think hearing about the faith of Mary and seeing how she and Elliot lived in those later stages of life, she felt the same way. She's gotten what she's been waiting for. To be in the arms of Jesus. 
The last thing I want to try and glean from this passage of Scripture is that this is a hope that is offered. And a hope that is offered has to be received. Let me read starting in verse 18 of chapter 5. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as through God, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, Paul didn't think he deserved any of this hope. He once called himself the chief of sinners. I'm the worst of the bunch, he said. He knew that by himself he deserved death and eternal punishment in hell. And he also knew that without outside intervention, that's exactly what he was going to get. Same is true for all of us. Don't think because I can get up here in a fancy suit that I don't deserve hell as much as the rest of you. That would make for a much more depressing funeral. But for the intervention of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the only person who could pay our penalty for us, but the only person who didn't deserve to, yeah. he's the one who loved us enough to do it. And that's the reason we have the hope. It doesn't just exist, it was earned for us. And we have to accept it, to be reconciled to God. And that's why Paul gave his life to imploring people, because not everyone has this hope. But Mary did. Paul did. I do. And I hope all of you do. See, you can go out into the world and you can find hope and you can find comfort for funerals, for death. It's a shallow comfort. Maybe they'll talk about some kind of afterlife. Some kind of world, I don't know what it's like, but some kind of world outside past death. And whoever the loved one is, they're probably watching you. And it's all just empty words. But then you open the Bible and you learn that you're not just going to live. You're going to live in a body. And God's not just going to send you to heaven. He's going to make a new earth for you to live in. And you're going to live with him. See, we don't just believe in an afterlife. We believe in life. And that's the hope that we have and in the giver of life. And so, brothers and sisters, I hope that you can have all the time and the space to grieve, but then have joy and hope in the midst of your grief. Knowing that we're the ones to grieve, she is the one who can have a choice. And if there's anyone here who hears my voice and hasn't been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, I hope that you see this like looking at something beautiful through a store window. Something that you don't have, but you can for free. Simply trust in Jesus. He takes away your sins and gives you eternal life. And then you can have the same hope. I'm sure that Mary is going to be ecstatic to see all of you there. When your time comes to go to be with the Lord. Paul devoted his life to sharing the good news of Jesus. I know that Mary and her husband did the same thing. I want to honor their life, more importantly than honoring their death, honor their life by sharing that good news with you. Because it's the only message that we need to hear, and it's the reason that we can have smiles as we come and remember someone who's no longer with us. Because we know that we are, because we've been reconciled to God, we're going to see her in our Savior. There's a song that really is very special to me that talks about this hope. I find it a great comfort. I'd like to share it with you guys. All right, it's called uh, It Is Not Death to Die.
wonderful thing about her that you want the rest of us to know? Oh, there was so many that on the spur of the moment <laughs> that we had good times together. We praised the Lord together and we just had a good family. <laughs> right now I can tell something funny. <laughs> Tell about the competition of having children. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Mary and Elliot were married before my husband, Tom, was married. And so when they got married, Elliot said, I'll call you my brother, but I won't call you my uncle. <laughs> that would have made my husband his uncle. <laughs> I'm just little funny things that I don't know if I should say, but when she was telling about swimming, Mary and love that. And we went in the mountains one day. And <laughs> Go ahead, you started. <laughs> we were trying to tell about uh, Mount Harrison and the end of down the lake. Well, there's three lakes going up there. Well, we got to the first lake and the second lake, and Mary come up missing. <coughs> so my husband said, I'm going to go find her. So when he got up to the third lake, she was skinning it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he kind of took her clothes and she hollered at him. <laughs> So 
I have a family, um, and I met the family through Hamlet, and then Harry, and um, I met all the Lovelaces, and <laughs> Mary and Elliot. Like, Elliot was a force of nature, <laughs> and Mary was the ground that kept him anchored here. And so it's just like, a lot of people don't know that Mary had a lot of anxiety. So she really lived a Christian life. She really lived in faith. And it's just like, as a role model to, to me, um, with my anxiety and stuff like that, it's just like, Mary was so gracious. And she was always loving. And um, aside from the fact that she liked pizza, she was a great person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I met Elliot and Mary the first time that they attended this church. And me and my late, late wife got to talking to them after church. And when we got home, we, my wife said to me, that's a pretty special couple. We need to invite them over. So we invited them over for lasagna. <laughs> it's close to pizza. <laughs> we didn't know. And uh, we, we started getting back and forth and having meals and uh, visiting with each other. And I, I never heard a harsh word out of Mary's mouth. And uh, it was just something special about both of them, but especially Mary. She was just so sweet in her spirit that it was beyond anything I had ever experienced with anyone. And uh, it uh, will be in my heart forever, having known her. Very good. So, uh, okay. Okay. My name is Tina, and I was a really close friend with me, I feel like, but I feel really bad because I've only known her for just a few years. But um, I know some things about her maybe other people don't. Sometimes just to give me a break, I'd go over and sit with her, which I have a lot of fun. But I don't know if a lot of members of the family knew what her favorite uh, TV show was. She liked the, um, the Ice Road Truckers. <laughs> You guys know real sweet Mary, right? I mean, she was really into that. Sometimes I try to talk to her, she'll shh. <laughs> okay. The only way you get her to stop is to say, Mary, you want to go out and see the birds? That would do it. We'd go sit with the birds. And we'd sit there and we'd start making up little stories about the birds. That was a lot of fun. But the thing that got me the most with Mary was watching the grace that she had of dying. She knew she was dying. She did it with so much grace and love and dignity. She knew that the Lord was waiting for her. She, there was no fright in her face or her eyes. She was always smiling. And to me, that was probably one of the best times in her life because she knew the Lord was waiting for her. And she had the most wonderful daughter sitting there <laughs> holding her hand the whole time. Yep. And Tina, you had, she had seen Mary. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Noticed that someone put Hannah's picture on the phone. <laughs> um, like mother, like daughter. And if you want to know, I've been in this community for five and a half years, and Harry and Hannah kind of adopted me. I spent a lot of time having meals over at their place with, with Mary, and, and it was such a, a, a blessing. 
But I just uh, wanted to say, if you want to get, if you folks, some of you didn't really get to know Mary, just get to know Hannah, and you will have the, the same pleasure as the rest of us. Amen. So, uh, Mike, would you take the mic? <laughs> May I lean on your shoulder there, Mike? No, you lean on that skirt. <laughs> You know, you know wait, sorry, two mics. Um, <laughs> he's always trouble. Um, Mom stole the thunder with the lake story, but, and then I kind of thought about what Trixie said, you know, she was in the ocean, that's cold. Now this was a mountain lake, 11,000 feet. Third lake up, you know, it's ice water, it's not cold, it's not warm. It wasn't warm, lake, so that's why she liked the ice road trucks, I guess. <laughs> But I remember Mary, you know, as a young child. And I remember one time uh, we had Bible conferences, and we'd gather together. You know, they'd come all the way from from uh, Canada, and uh, of course, while he was in Canada, we'd always send tapes. We'd record a, a little tape and send it to him, and they'd record over it and send it back to us. And so we kind of knew what the family was doing back and forth. I remember one time in Boise, Idaho, we was uh, at a conference. And Mary was combing her hair. There was a little back room there, and a, little, well, a mirror, and she was combing her hair. And you see the picture on there, and it reminded me of that. But her hair would come clear down below her uh, knee, the back of her leg. Wow. And uh, you could watch her comb it out. It was just a mirror. <laughs> and of course, I always got to see my cousin, Hannah. She was my beau. You know. She was that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, how wonderful it was to be able to get together as often as we did. You know, Elliot was only in Burley for maybe a few years. Um, it's a long story. Mike, when do you want, you, how much time do we have before the... Two minutes. I'll try to make it two minutes. You know, my dad had lost his first wife and, and just was troubled. He tried to find peace at churches and he went to, he couldn't find any. Somebody finally told him, go see Myrtle Rainers. And Myrtle Ray Nixon, this is a whole other story, but she had heard of Ken Reese from Boise. And Ken, uh, Elliot was training with Ken, and Ken told Elliot, he says, I think there's somebody, some need in, in Burley. You need to go to Burley, I don't know. And he stopped there in that first week. He said there was 14 souls that came to the Lord. My dad, his sister, his, her family, her three children, and that's where all this family came from. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Elliot was, he wasn't planning on staying in birth, but that 14 souls came to the Lord. And Elliot prayed about it, and he had to stay on it. And uh, thank the Lord he did. Not only was uh, a lot of this family here because of that, I'm here because of that. <laughs> and thank the Lord, thank the Lord for those who love the Lord and serve the Lord and gave him honor and glory.